I want to share with you the power of free. The power of the name of Jesus. The power of the word of God. And the power of the blood of the Lamb. Before we get into it, we're talking a lot about power. So, you know, yesterday evening at dinner time, my nephew was saying, Mama, I want power. I want power. And I said, son, what power do you want? I want power to move from one place to the, the next. And you know, children want all sorts of power. They, they kind of look up to superheroes. Yeah? It could be, you know, my time it was Batman and Robin and Superman, and now we have all the ninjas. We've got lots of heroes. And because we, we attracted to them because of the power. Okay, and now with the football fever happening, we've got all these heroes, football heroes, that we want to link to. So what is power? Power means many things to many people. Power could mean greatness. Okay, power is a marked ability to do something. If you have talent and you can sing, you can play in the violin, you mesmerize the crowd, you have power over them. Okay? Um, also, like Leonardo da Vinci, Monet, all these people have artistic talent, ability. They've got power. Power could also mean strength. Now, you, when you think of strength, who comes to mind? Anyone? The strongest man? Samson, the Hulk, somebody said, yes. These people have physical power. They can move things. They can make things happen with their strength. Power is might. It has to do with strength. Power is also force. You know, like the hurricane, Haiyan, that blue. I mean, power can be very destructive. Uh, so power could be any of those things. But I like the definition of power, which, which states it is the capacity to bring about change. Now, all the powers we talked about, the definitions, power is the capacity to bring about change. And power, there are lots of symbols. I tried doing this PowerPoint, tried to get the different symbols, the symbol of a flag, symbolizing kind of power of a country. You know, when you climb Mount Everest, the first person went up, why did they put the flag? They wanted to symbolize the power of the country to acknowledge that this is the country that achieves that, you know, feat. Uh, why does a king wear a crown? It symbolizes his royalty, yeah, his kingship. There are lots of um, coats of arms people wear, I mean, in, in the government, and it all symbolizes power. If you're in the army, they've got all these badges, these stripes they put. You know, one stripe, private. Two stripes, corporal. Three stripes, sergeant. So all of it has ranking. So power, there are degrees of power as well. And the other day, I was, I'm finding my way about in Malaysia now, trying to drive. And that's a feat for me. I was driving in Jaran Utara, Utara and I was going on towards uh, Jalan Gasing. And there's the federal highway here. And you know, the traffic, it was stalling. I see the traffic light is green. But the cars are all stopping. And I'm like, what's happening here? You know, and I'm craning my neck to see what's happening. And I see this big truck in front of me as well. And it's stopping. And I'm saying, this is crazy. The lights are showing green. And lo and behold, when I look, I see a small statued man with his hands raised. And this man is nothing. He doesn't have the power of Samson, I know. But he's wearing a uniform. That uniform is symbolic of power. He carries the authority of the Malaysian government. He is powerful. Nobody's stopping because of the man. If he was in normal clothes, nobody will give another thought about him. But because he was wearing the uniform, a symbol of authority, he could stop that big truck. Just before we go into the meat of the message, I just want to tell you in a nutshell the story of how God wanted it to be from the foundation of time. You know, in creation, right in the beginning of Genesis, in Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our own image. God created man and he said, I'll give him dominion, dominion over all 
the fish in the sea, dominion over all the fowls in the air, dominion over every living thing on earth, dominion over all the creepy crawlies. That was God's plan for man, for Adam and Eve to rule, to dress the garden, to rule on earth, to occupy it, to have dominion. In fact, God gave Adam the power to name things, and that's such a powerful authority given. This authority was given. But you know, coming to Genesis 3, 6, we know what happened. Eve was deceived by Satan. She ate of the fruit. Adam followed suit. And that power, the keys of the kingdom, was taken back because sin separates us from God. Sin causes destruction. It causes all the plans of God for our life not to happen. So we have the fall. And the world's in chaos. There's enmity between, you know, the princes of the air and with humankind. But you know, in John 3.16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, so whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. This was the game plan changed all over. God said, I've got a plan to redeem my people. I love them so much. I have to send my only son. Only Jesus can undo what the first Adam did. The first Adam sinned. Jesus, the last Adam, God-man had to come down and redeem us. But you know, Jesus did that. He died on the cross. He shed his blood. We have that power again. But you know... We're still in warfare because Jesus wants us to exercise our right here, right now, until he comes again. When he comes again, and he is coming again really soon, when he comes again, he will give the final death blow to Satan and he will cast him in the lake of fire. But until then, God has given us, Jesus has paid the price, it is done. He has given us back the keys. He has given us back dominion, but we're still in warfare because we're on this earth, because of sin. But we have authority. We have dominion over it. But the enemy is a roaring lion. He is seeking. He's like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. He's coming at us. We don't know. We think we're sitting in a very calm building. Everyone's comfortable. There's no bombs exploding, is there? There is no flashes of, you know, there's nothing, no missiles, nothing. So calm, so peaceful here. But I tell you, for truth, we're in warfare. You get up in the morning and you think, oh God, I, I mean to do good. And suddenly I start swearing. I start doing things that I'm not supposed to do. I get frustrated. I get discouraged. And we don't know that there are little foxes. I call all these little foxes that spoil the vine. We get up every day, we ask God, bless our day, and then things happen. And we think things are just happening. But the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We look at somebody else has annoyed me, somebody else has hurt me. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Those are the things we are wrestling. But it comes in the guise of people. The enemy uses people to get at us. So just to say, God has not left us powerless. He's given us power to overcome the enemy. And the first power I want to talk about today is the power of the name of Jesus. Okay? You know, some of you may be Shakespeare students. In Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare said, What is in a name that we call it a rose by any other name will smell as sweet? So Shakespeare was saying literally, it doesn't matter. A name is just a name. It's what it, it does. Okay? So he has a different philosophy, but I want to suggest to you, a name is just not a name. A name is just not a label. 
a lot of people give names to their children, to their pets, and they do it very flippantly. You know, Beckham, I mean, I'm not criticizing any parents. You can choose to call your child anything. But they give them names of places, Brooklyn. They give them names of uh, pets. They give them names of flowers, poppy. You know, and maybe they don't spare a thought. Some people do. But God, for God, names are important. Abram had a name. His parents gave him that name. But God, when he wanted to use Abraham, when he called him from the earth, they called these, he changed his name. He put his rock in him. He put his breath in Abraham. And he said, Abraham, and the last bit of the suffix of his name. He breathed into Abraham and gave him a new name, father of all nations. Same with Sarai. God changed her name. May the mother of all nations. What about Jacob? Jacob, yes, Israel, but Jacob was a supplanter, you know, he was a deceiver. He tried to steal his brother's birthright. But when God, when he wrestled with God, and I say about Jacob because Bethel is a portal where Jacob wrestled with God. He didn't let God go. He wrestled with him and God changed his name. And he said, you shall be called Israel, Prince Correct, Joel. Prince. So God, for God, names are important. And the name of Jesus, in Matthew 1, it talks about how Jesus' name um, came into being. In verse 21, it says, And she shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Jesus is a savior. That's what Jesus means. Every time we cry out to Jesus, we're saying, save us, save us. And you know, Jesus' name was not when it happened, when Mary and Joseph had him. That's not when it happened. It happened, it was prophesied long, long time ago. You know, way back in the prophets, it, it says, a virgin shall be with child, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So whenever we call, use the name of Jesus, we're saying, God is with us. God is with us. I want to bring you back to the New Testament. When Jesus, you know, Jesus did a lot of things, but he was especially close to his 12 disciples. And he takes, and occasionally, he goes on retreats with them to Caesarea of Philippi. They, they go to a place called Benias, and I went there when I visited Israel. Very beautiful place, very calming, lots of like waterfalls and streams. And Jesus was sitting with his disciples, and he said to them, what do men, what do men say? Who do they say I am? And then the disciples said, well, hmm, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're the prophet. And then Jesus narrowed down his question. He said, but who do you say I am? And then steps out Peter and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Peter, but Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my father in heaven. I emphasize this point. Jesus' name is a mighty name. God has given him a name above every other name. Every other name. Jesus' name tops the rank. Bigger than the general, bigger than any king in this earth. Jesus is the king of kings. His name is right on the top. And you know when the authority is right on the top, everything else has to bow down. God said... Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess the name of Jesus. It's going to happen, whether you like it or not. It is going to happen. God said in John, the word of God says in John 13, 3, the Father has given all things unto his hands. And in Matthew, when Jesus, before he went up, to be 
with his Father in heaven, Jesus said in Matthew 28, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. All power. So who's got all power? Jesus has all power. And he tells his disciples, Go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, teaching them all that I commanded you, and lo, I will be with you till the end of the world. Jesus has given the mandate. He's given us back the keys of the kingdom. He's given us back. When he died, he went down to Hades, and he took back from the enemy the keys that were lost from the first Adam. And he said, I'm giving it to you, all power. Go in my name. Go in my name. Jesus said, Pastor Lewa mentioned it earlier. Jesus said in John 15, 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I have ordained you. What have I ordained you for? To bear much fruit. And that your fruit will remain. So that whatever you ask my father in my name, he will give it to you. Jesus is giving us the mandate. He said, I've chosen you. I've chosen you. I've chosen you. You've not chosen me. I have ordained you. I have given you the power. He wants you to bear fruit. And your fruit must not be taken away. It must remain. Okay, so that whenever you ask anything in my Father's name, he will give it to you. You know, we sang this song, the name of the Lord is it's a strong and mighty tower. The name of the Lord Nothing else. The name of the Lord is a strong and mighty tower. The righteous, what do they do? They run and take refuge in that name. And they are safe. They are safe. This is not detracting for the message. I'm using this as an analogy. You know the U.S. green card? One of the superpowers in the world, U.S., United States of America. In order for a foreigner to go and stay there and enjoy the privileges of this place, they need to get to come into possession of a green card. And that green card gives you lots and lots of benefits. Without that green card, you can't work there. You can't go uh, get loans. You can't have housing, nothing of that sort. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, Jesus is your green card. He is your passport. Jesus' name gives you authority. It gives you dominion. It gives you power. It gives you influence. No other name. Jesus' name is all you need. When you're faced with any problem, run to Jesus. Come in his name. Use the authority of his name. You know, children do this a lot. It's my nephew. Anytime he wants anything, he says, my daddy said. Children in school, whenever they want something doing, they say, my teacher said. They know how to use the name of human beings in authority in the world. How much more we, children of the living God. God has said, use the name of my only begotten son, Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to ask you, are there Goliaths in your life? I want you to bring you back to the story of David and Goliath. You're familiar with that story? Do you know when David, David is a shepherd boy. We've heard that in some of the sermons that Jerry has shared. He didn't have very much, just a staff, a sling, and some stones. But he faced the giants in his life. He faced Goliath. How did he come to Goliath? He ran to Goliath and he said to Goliath, he spoke, 
And he said, you've got a spear, you've got a spear got a shield, but I come to you in the mighty name of the God of hosts. I come in to you in the mighty name of the Lord of hosts, the captain of heaven's army. I'm, I'm expanding this. He talked about God's army, Israel. I come to you. You have defiled it. I'm coming to you in that name. So he just went with what he had, but using the mighty name of Jesus you know, Jesus said, I am the way. I'm saying to you today, Jesus is your authority. Jesus is your power. Use Jesus' name. If you have any illness, remember, cancer is just a name. Speak to it. In Jesus' name, I take authority. Speak to it. Is there a problem in your life? Speak to your problem. Say in Jesus' name, I command you. Because the authority has been given to us, we just have to use it. Use it. I want to urge all of you to come, come knowing that by using the name of Jesus, wherever we pray, we say, we ask this all in Jesus' name, because he's the way. Okay, you get the first step. That's the power, first power. I'm not categorizing it, but I'm saying that's our first step, first spot of call. Jesus' name. Jesus said, if I go to the Agong's house and I say, let me come in, they look at me, they say, who are you? But if the Agong's son, Raja, somebody goes in, immediately access. Now this comes with a bit of a condition. Jesus' name is not a mantra, because we can teach parrots to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It is not a mantra to be repeated. In order to use Jesus' name, you must have connectivity. I just brought something here. I know what you're wondering, you're thinking, my, my, what is Caroline up to? We see this tool, it's an iron. So I happen to have it in my room, so I thought I'd bring it as a demonstration. This iron is just a tool, no power, nothing. But when this iron is plugged to the source of all, the greatest source of all, okay, when that happens, the light switched on, power is flowing. Inanimate thing, power is flowing, and I also put water in it, so what I want to demonstrate to you is there has to be connectivity. I can't use the name of Jesus if I don't have a connection with the source of all power. So, power. Just now, nothing. Connected to the source of all power, you see, you know, energy, light, steam. And this power can iron away all wrinkles in your life. Everything that is not smooth in your life, you can iron it away using the power of Jesus' name. All truth is parallel. I just so showed you something that is now natural world. Okay? But in order to have real, uh, the power of using Jesus' name, we need to have a relationship with Jesus. A relationship. Am I going through that? In Acts, Ephesus, this is a place in Turkey, some place which I visited, beautiful place. Uh, Paul's there and he's doing these mighty works of God healing the sick, evil spirits being delivered. He's doing so much. Two years he was there. And he was preaching God's word, preaching the power of the Holy Spirit. And the anointing was so strong on Paul. And whenever people took his handkerchief or apron and laid it on the sick, the sick became healed. Yeah? The demons in the sick left now, wow, that is power, okay? 
So you know what? There are some people, the sons of Sceva. Sceva is a chief priest. Chief priest had seven sons, Sceva. And they say, wow, we like that. Why not? We try and use Jesus' name. So they saw the evil spirits there in a person. And they tried to do the same. What happened? The evil spirit turned around and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know. Who are you? Who are you? So you can use the name of Jesus, but if you don't have a relationship with you, this is what is going to happen. What happened to the sons of Sceva? Chief priest's son. Sons. They got whipped by the demon. They ran out naked and wounded. So brothers and sisters, know that in order to use the name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus, him that is above every other name, we must have a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus. Okay, I think I, I've emphasized how important that power, that Jesus is the way, his name is so, so powerful. Okay, use his name. So that's the first power I've covered. But next, I want to talk to you about the power of the word. Now the word, there's something about the word, uh, the spoken word. There's a lot of power. The spoken word. Uh, God said, it's written, all scripture, all scripture is inspired by God. We've got it. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. This is all here. Yeah, the word of God, the spoken word of God. The power of God's word. Let's have that. Oops, sorry. In the beginning, God said. Now, God could have been like, you know, I dream of Jenny, go, hmm, do that. Or God could have just said, and something happened. God could have pointed. But God said. He spoke. There is something when Elohim speaks, there is a creative power that comes forth. Next power. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. There is something about God's word being enduring. There is consistency. Now everything else is going to go, but there's one thing that will remain is the word of God. And we've got that word of God. That word of God is so powerful. God said in Isaiah 55 verse 11, My word that goes out of my mouth shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish all that I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. You know, the imagery that comes to me is like a heat missile, you know, in army and all, when they do warfare, the self plays, they send. Once they send this missile, it will find wherever it is supposed to go and find and destroy. God's word is like that. It is so powerful. It won't come back empty. It will accomplish what God said. And if we know that, we need to speak God's word to any situation in our life. Because that word is powerful. It is life. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living. It's not dead. This is written and you think it's just a book. But this book the words in this book, God's word is alive. It is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, the word of God can divide the soul and the spirit. It can divide the marrow from the bones. It can discern the intent and the thoughts of our hearts. So the word of God, you know, it transforms us inside out. So the word of God is a double-edged sword. It does surgery for us. God does a little surgery and says, Haha, this is what's in your heart, child. And then if we succumb to him, say, Lord, forgive me, we have 
healing there. The word of God is also powerful to use to all the enemies that come against us. The word of God is truth. We've heard that. If you know the truth, you will be set free. You know, the Bible says uh, there are lots of, in Ephesians 6, lots of weapons that we have at our disposal. Five of it is defensive weapons. Every morning I make it a habit because I know I'm a soldier of the living God. I wake up before I can do anything else in that day. I will put on my whole armor because the word of God tells me to do that. It's all defensive. It is for me to stand and be strong in it. So I put on the girdle of truth. So I'm standing on God's truth and I won't be deceived by Satan's lies. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. The blood of Jesus guards my heart and I am safe. I put on the shoes of peace wherever I go. This is holy ground. I speak God's peace. Every turmoil will have to bow down, will have to go in Jesus' name. I put on, I take on the shield of faith. So when the fiery darts of the enemy comes, when doubt comes, when, you know, uh, distress comes, when the enemy tries to discourage me, the shield is there. It just goes, boing, out. It just bounces off because I've got the shield of faith around me. And, there's on, and then we put on the helmet of salvation, okay, protecting our mind from all the darts of the enemy. The enemy does a lot of damage here, talks to our mind, puts doubts in your mind. If God says you can do it, he'll say, did God say? Always question mark. So one offensive weapon God has given us. God has given us the sword of the spirit. The sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. This is powerful. Because with the sword of the Spirit, you really can attack the enemy offensively. If he says something, you counterattack. The best, best example I could say is Jesus. Jesus overcame Satan by the Word. You know when Jesus, after he got baptized and the Holy Spirit descended on him, the Spirit of God took him into the wilderness, and there he was fasting 40 days, 40 nights. He was very hungry. And Satan came to him and he said, If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Now he's appealing to Jesus' physiological needs. He was hungry. And Jesus said, It is written, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. So Satan couldn't win him there. So Satan upped his ante. He took Jesus to Jerusalem, to a high temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. And now Satan knows scripture. Are you surprised? He's quoting from the Old Testament. He said, for he's quoting Psalm 91 verse 11. He said, for... His angels will give charge over you. They will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. See how clever he is? He knows God's word, but he doesn't have a relationship with God. So it's null and void. And then he couldn't get Jesus there. This time he was appealing to Jesus' will, his soul, his emotions, you know, his pride. Satan attacked in that area. And the third time, uh, Satan took Jesus up. To the mountain now this is to the highest level now right up there and he says look all these beautiful you know things around the luxuries of the world the buildings the powers there i will give you if you will bow down to me and what did jesus say it is written thou shall worship the lord your god only and him only shall you serve. So every time the enemy tried to tempt Jesus, Jesus quoted the word of God. Jesus didn't just do mind reading with him. Jesus spoke it. Jesus agreed what God had said long time ago. And there was power in that. And the enemy 
defeated, had to flee. But remember, the enemy is just a roaring lion. He's just roaring. He's got no power, but he's got power to deceive you. He's got power to frustrate you. He's got power to give, put doubts. Anytime you want to do something with God, the enemy will say, no, you can't do it. You're not that clever. You know other people are there to do it. Or don't do it now. Do it later. The enemy is constantly challenging God's word. As believers, we need to know God's word. And we need to use the sword of the spirit. I couldn't bring a real sword to wield here. The sword of the spirit is the truth of God. It is the truth of the Holy Spirit. We need to wield that sword. In order to do, use the word of God. There are conditions again. It depends on knowledge. It depends on our faith. And it depends on our skill. We need to declare the word of God over our life. We need to agree with God. You know... In Isaiah 54, verse 17, it says, No weapon fashioned against us will prosper. Every tongue that rises against us, I shall condemn. For this is our heritage and our righteousness is of God. We need to quote those things. The devil is a liar. He is the prince of lies. But God is true. God is all truth. Speak the word of truth over your life. God's word cancels thrones, it exposes the lies of the enemy. Coming back in using knowledge. That power I said depends on knowledge. God's word says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Okay? If you don't know God's word, how can you use it? If you don't know God said something, how can you defend yourself? You firstly must know God's word. Secondly, you must believe it. You must believe it here. Not, impo- not only know the head knowledge, it must be applied to your heart. You must believe what God said is true. And you need to practice using God's word. In order to be skillful, you need practice. Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. God has given every one of us a measure of faith. Yeah? We need to exercise this faith muscle. How do we exercise this faith mes- muscle? We need to memorize God's word. Memorize. Now, as I was preparing this message, brothers and sisters, this is so true. The Holy Spirit dropped in me and said, tell my people to expose this lie of the enemy. The enemy has told us the older we go, we get, we cannot remember. That is a lie from the pit of hell. The older you get, the better your memory should be. The better your memory should be. But the enemy says, you know, children, oh, you're going to school, university, that time you feel you're very sharp. And then we always say, as we get older, myself included, oh, I'm having a senior moment. Senior moment. So I forgot. But God has given us You know how many billion neurons in our brain? 70 billion. This is what researchers said. 70 billion neurons. One neuron equates one computer. Einstein only used 5% of his brain. What are we doing? Einstein used 5%. I'm not saying anything, but I'm saying what are we doing with the rest of the percentage of our brain? How does information get into your brain? We need to rehearse. I'm talking to you uh, from a standpoint of a psychologist. I do say to others, in order to get information in, you need to rehearse information. When it gets into your short term, when you rehearse it, you rehearse it like you want to remember a telephone number. You keep saying it over and over again. After some time, it gets into your long term. And then when you want it, you say, hey, what's the number? Mm -mm." You think from the long term, it can be pulled out. So I want to say to you all, please don't listen to the enemy who says, every time you read God's word, I cannot remember this. I take out the Bible to read, I fall asleep. This happens. So God's word is so important. We need to memorize God's word. 
we need to use all our neurons, and we can store plenty, we can memorize all of this and much more. This gives us power, power. We meditate on God's word. God's uh, in our Father, you know the prayer in Matthew 6, when uh, the disciples asked God, how do we pray? And God said, Jesus taught them this, say our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread. This is bread for you. Not just the roti that we eat. This is spiritual food. You need to eat it daily. In the manner when it fell, you, God taught them in the desert, daily pick up and eat. Because if you keep it, you know, in, in the manner, bit, it, it gets uh, kind of spoiled. So God said, you've got to chew. You know when the cow chews on grass, it chews and chews. He's got so many stomachs, so it chews and it really takes all the nutrients in. And then the digestion happens. And that food gets converted into blood. And that blood flows throughout the whole body. Then the word of God is in you. Yeah? It is you and the, the word of God is there. Um, now, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and revelation. The Holy Spirit will help you remember. The Holy Spirit will help you remember what you've already put in your heart. We know we cannot go to the hole in the wall. That's what I mean, the May Bank or whatever public bank. Put in the card, off with money. If you didn't put in money there, no money is going to come out. If you didn't put in God's word in your heart, not just your head, in your heart, if you didn't lay up the treasure in your heart, you cannot do withdrawals. Cannot. So please, memorize God's word. Chew on it. Chew on it. Let it get into, assimilate into your system. Then when you face the enemy, when you're in trouble, you can, the Holy Spirit will bring to memory. The Holy Spirit will reveal. The Holy Spirit will put a spotlight it will illuminate God's word. And then when you speak the logos of God, joined with the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a chemical reaction in physical terms. There is something that happens. The dunamis, the rhema word of God will come. It's like lightning. And it will break whatever curse is upon you. It will break that sickness, whatever you know, illness or problem or situation that you're in. I've got this mantra. God said it. I believe it. I declare it. I don't think about it. I declare it. Why? For the enemy's sake. So he will know I know. And that settles it. If God said it, I believe it. I declare it. That settles it. Done. How many of us do really believe when God says something? You know, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. We need to do sword training. I want to highlight an example in the Old Testament, Elijah. It's in 1 Kings 18. There was dryness in the land. There was no rain for several years. Then God told Elijah, go to Ahab and tell him there's going to be rain. Now, if I go around and tell people there's going to be rain tomorrow, will anybody believe me? But if God told me to say, it will happen. Not what I say. What God says will happen. God told Elijah, go to Ahab, tell him the rain is going to come. So what does Ahab do? Sorry, what does Elijah do? Elijah goes to King Ahab after his victory on Mount Carmel. I'm not going to go into that. It's so exciting and tempting, but... I'll stay with the text. Elijah goes to King Ahab and he says, God said, there is a sound of abundance of rain. God said it. Elijah just went and proclaimed it. There is a sound. Proclaimed it to the king. He obeyed God, went to the king. There is a sound of abundance of rain. Not a drop of rain in sight. No cloud, nothing. But Elijah, in faith, operating in faith, believing in the substance of things not seen, hoping for that. Yeah, he believed for that and he spoke it. 
And then he told King Ahab, eat, drink, rain is coming. But Elijah did something else. King is nicely eating and making merry. Elijah went up to Mount Carmel. Elijah went down on his knees. He put his head down. Elijah prayed. Why do we need to pray? God said it. Why pray? Why pray? Elijah was agreeing with God. God, you said it. God works in partnership with us. I'm going to agree with you. You said there's rain. I'm going to pray. I'm going to join with you. I'm going to declare rain is coming. He sent his servant to check. Look in the sea. Is there any cloud? Servant went once. Came back. No, one time. Elijah said, go again. Elijah's carrying on praying. This is persistent prayer. Goes again. Any rain? No. It's not been raining for a few years. I don't know whether the servant believed. Didn't matter. Elijah believed. Elijah knew his God. Third time. No rain. No, no sign. Seven times. On the seventh time, the servant said, I see a cloud the size of a fist so small. So then Elijah got his answer. He said to his servant, tell King Ahab, prepare yourself. Quickly come to Jezreel, the valley. If, if not, the rain will overtake you. So the king heard it and the king got his chariot and he's riding. But you know, Elijah, the Bible says, I'm not going to go, I, I meant to go through each verse, but the Bible says, Elijah girded his loins with God's truth. He girded his loins and he ran. He ran. He overtook King Ahab who was on his mighty chariot and his king's mighty horses. You see the power of God's man? When you believe God's word, when you act on God's word, when you don't take it like Ting Chai, God said it, okay, let's, okay lah, God, you said it, what? Let it happen. You are God. I got no bit in it. Elijah exercised faith. He did sword, sword training on his knees. He did sword training. He knew God's word. He knows God is not a liar. God has shown himself faithful to Elijah. You have experienced God. You know the power of God in your life. Train in God's word. Exercise faith. Faith needs to grow. Faith is a muscle. It needs to grow. Without faith, we cannot please God. And our level of faith will grow. And as our level of faith grow, we get into an intimacy with God because we will see God respond in different ways to us. So, Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You have power. You can speak life. You also can speak death. How many of us, Haya, today, ah, this has gone wrong, that got wrong. We're always speaking death of ourselves. God says, speak what I say about you. I say you are wonderfully and fearfully made. I say you can do all things through my son, to Christ who strengthens you. Speak that. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness, I have drawn you. God says, I have a purpose for your life, a future, a hope for you. Believe that. Speak that. Look from the perspective of God's eyes, what God is saying. Don't look at your circumstances. That is the physical. Jerry has been sharing that we have to get onto another dimension. The law of aerodynamics. We have to see things from God's perspective. Okay. So please, any situation that's dead in your life, resurrect it in Jesus' name. Speak life. Jesus, he died, he rose. Situation that's dead in my life. My poverty arise in Jesus' name. I ask for wealth. My sickness be gone in Jesus' name. But use his word. We've got to speak that word. So the word of God is powerful. And the third 
power I want to declare to you is power of the blood. We sang that song. There is power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Blood of the Lamb. Jesus became that sacrificial Lamb. God made a blood covenant with us. Heaven's best, his only begotten son, paid the ultimate price for our redemption, for our healing, for our peace, for our freedom. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes I am healed. If there's anyone sick here, claim that word. That word is life. By his stripes you are healed. You are already healed. 2,000 years ago when Jesus died, that blood was shed. You are already healed. What you want to pray is for the manifestation of healing. Manifestation only. You believe, you agree with God. God, you said, I'm going to stand on your word. I'm going to stand on your word. Your word is true. The, level, the devil is a liar. I'm not going to listen to him. I'm going to stand on your word. I'm going to believe you. I'm going to exercise faith like Elijah. There is no rain for three and a half years. There's no rain. Nobody saw it. But God said it. Elijah believed it. He went down on his knees and prayed. He prayed persistent prayer. You know, one time, two time, three time, you know, discouragement. Seven is like number of completion. It, it could mean a lot of things. It goes on and on. But you pray till your answer comes. You pray because Jesus said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. It's not maybe, you know. It's not maybe 50-50. No, it's 100%. Knock, 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 keep on knocking. Actually, the real version is keep on at it. You know, the, the widow who came to this judge, you all know the story, some, several lawyers here. You know, the, the, the ungodly judge didn't want to get up and, and help her. But she kept on persistence. That's persistence prayer. Pray, pray, keep agreeing on what God says. You will see your miracle happen. Amen? Just want to say, Life is in the blood. We all know that. Heart goes, blood doesn't pump through your body. You're dead. You're gone. No blood, no life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is the blood that gives you life. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Sin brings death, but Jesus' blood gives us eternal life. Children of God, a family of God, as we've been talking earlier, family of God. There is power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. In, a, in Exodus, in Exodus 12, 21, it talks about the Passover lamb. The children of Israel were going to leave. God was taking them out of a place of bondage into the promised land. God had shown himself mighty by all the ten miracles he had done, nine. The last one was the Passover lamb. He said the angel of death was going to pass through all the houses. And he told the people... To get a lamb, a lamb without blemish, keep that lamb, feed that lamb for a bit, and then kill that lamb, precious lamb. Take the blood, the hyssop, put it on the lintels, put it on the doorpost. Now, God is very specific when he says that. That's the door, that's the entrance. And he said, when the angel of death passes, it'll pass over. That's why we call it Passover. Passover lamb. Jesus became that sacrificial Passover lamb for us. You know, they, they say about the wills. I just want to highlight about wills. The will only can be executed, you know, when somebody dies. F 
Father God sent Jesus, made a covenant with us, his will can be exercised because of the blood of Jesus. Because Jesus died, we can have that redemption. We can have that salvation. We can have that forgiveness of sin. Because of that, we can have all the inheritance, which is not ours, was Jesus. We get it. We inherit because of the blood of Jesus. Because of the price, the ultimate price Jesus paid. He cannot do, I think, any more for us. He gave everything. Everything. So we need to appropriate, appropriate the blood. I talked about the name of Jesus. That's the way. I talked about the word of God. Speaking the word of God. And finally, the blood of the lamb. I'm not saying that it's any inferior, but the blood of the lamb. When we appropriate, apply the blood. When we apply the blood of our situation. There is healing in the blood of the lamb. There is forgiveness in the blood of the lamb. There is peace in the blood of the lamb. There is freedom in the blood of the lamb. There is provision for your needs in the blood of the lamb. Everything you need is wrapped up in that life-giving blood of Jesus Christ, the mighty, mighty Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And you know, when we take, I, I put this as a prompt there, Holy Communion. When we do Holy Communion, Jesus said, do it as my memorial. He said, do it as often as I can. Whenever we take communion, we are remembering what Jesus did for us 2,000 years on the cross, ago on the cross. He came, he died, he shed his blood, he was buried, he rose again. That's what communion is all about. We are remembering what God did, his covenant he did with us. And we are saying, Lord, we remember, we are thankful, we are partaking of this. We are proclaiming you're coming again. You're coming again. So communion is such an important thing. So every time you do that, if there's any infirmity in your body, plead the blood of Jesus over yourself. There is cleansing, there's forgiveness, there is healing, there is restoration in the blood of Jesus. This is my final slide. I want to suggest to you, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, in John 14, 6, I don't think the Holy Spirit made a mistake in the order it was said. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I'm the life. I tried to use color coding. I said... We, when we pray, these are our powers we've got. When we pray, use, first spot of call, use the name of Jesus. Come in the name of Jesus. Because there is no other name higher than the name of Jesus. Jesus, I said, is your green card. He is your passport. Okay? You have access. He is the way. He is the Jalan. Use him. Because God gave him to us. That name. Not any other name. That mighty name, Jesus. Take authority. Take authority. Take back from the enemy. We've already got back the keys of the kingdom. We just need to use it. Second point, Jesus said, I'm the truth. Declare my word. My word is truth. Declare my word. Exercise faith. Speak the truth of my word over your life. Don't listen to the enemy. He is speaking lies. He is the great deceiver, the deceptor, the destroyer, the accuser of the brethren. You speak life over your situation. I don't care who has told you. I don't care if any medical doctor has said something to you. I don't care. If you believe God and you trust him, please let me put a caution here, caveat. It doesn't mean God doesn't work through medicine. God has told you something. Use medicine. God works through medicine. But believe God. God has spoken to you. You will know it in your heart. You know. Believe God. Act on what God says. Not what your friends say. Not what your bosses say. Not what anybody says. God is the only true person. Every man is a liar, but God be true. The word of God says. And thirdly, 
apply the blood. Apply the blood. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. This is covenant. Blood covenant made with you. Apply it. God says, I gave all my blood so that you can have life and life abundant. You can have health, perfect health. Why not? God made us. Jesus said that. I'm going to believe that. I know creation has fallen. I'm going to claim healing. I am. If Jesus said he's made us rich in all things, he wants to bless us, I'm going to shout. I am rich in him. Not just rich, metaphorically speaking, in every way. I'm going to believe God for my peace, for my healing. Do you know when I talked about the power of three, it's like this, all these three powers coming together. It's like a magnifying glass. When the light comes through, it zooms into a point, and then the dunamis of God happens. It happens. You need to believe it. You need to come in Jesus' name. No other name. You need to speak it, faith, exercise, thought training, and you need to apply the blood. No point if I got a wound down there and the, the doctors say, put the cream. Okay, la, I got the cream here. I know what the cream can do. I know the wound is here, but I don't apply. Apply the blood. Apply the blood. There is wonder working power in the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So very soon, I'm just going to end here. I uh, just pray that the word of God is sealed into your hearts, that it will come alive as the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance what has been shared. Can we have communion?